Good morning, Full Life Church. How you doing this morning? Listen, I think you guys came ready today. Anybody come ready? Sound like it, even when we were baptizing, you guys were hooping and hollering and cheering. I'm like, man, they've had their Starbucks already. No, it's the presence of God. He is the one who makes the difference. Amen? It's his presence that makes all the difference in the world. And when you encounter the presence of God, just one moment with him can change your life forever. So we're glad you're here today. Can you do me a favor? Can you help us welcome those who are watching us online? We want to say welcome to you. We hope you've already felt the presence of God where you're at like we have here. So just to reiterate something that Amber said about these prayer walk guides, you know, I did my first one last Friday, and man, it was a powerful experience. And then Josh, our, uh, our Next Steps guy, he, he did his this past week with his family. I don't know if you saw that on Facebook, but man, we're already hearing testimonies of people being impacted by these every neighborhood prayer walks. And so here's my challenge to you. Before you leave today, they're, they're back in the back. You can grab those as you leave. And here's what we want you to do. Post on social media, hashtag prayer driven. Everybody say prayer driven. So I want, to see, I want to see us just engage in this because I believe, I honestly believe that God's going to move some mountains and he's going to give us a harvest. How many of you believe that? That when we pray, he, he moves, amen? So I want to challenge all of you to take part of that. Be a part of this Every Neighborhood Initiative. And then in your seat, you probably had one of these. We're encouraging you to take notes during the message series because here's what we want to do. We don't just want you to hear the word here. We want you to take it home. And apply it to your lives. How many of you know that God, God's word is powerful? And so when you take it and apply it, it's going to change your life. It'll change your heart. And on the back, we've given you a little bit of help. If you have a, a struggle with maybe how to study the word of God, there's what we call the soap meth method, and that's on the back there. You can study the scripture, read the scripture, observe what it says, apply it, and then pray, God, help me apply it. Amen? So if you have that today, you can go ahead and take notes. Anybody ready to hear God's word this morning? All right, good, 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 because I'm ready to give it. Now, as we've, we've been talking about in this Beatitude series, this is not the easiest series to hear, right? And even more to try to preach, amen? And here's the reason, because the Beatitudes are so countercultural. They're so upside down to the way the world does things that it really challenges us as followers of Jesus. And so it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, right? Because the, he, Jesus said this the way. He said, you're blessed when you do them. Amen? How I many you know you want to be blessed? And I'm not talking about this happiness that, that's based on what's happening to you in the world. You know, ups and downs, the stock market, gas prices, all that, that stuff. I'm talking about an inward joy that you experience because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus had in mind when he said, blessed, and then he made the statement. And then also the benefits. Remember we said blessed are those who are poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs, right? We said blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. We said blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for what? They shall be filled. And so you notice with every blessing comes the actual blessing. Is that that making sense to anybody this morning? And then so last week we said that, you know, hey, blessed are the merciful which we challenged you to, to really always land on the side of mercy rather than judgment, right? Remember uh, what James says, mercy triumphs over what? Say it loud. Judgment. And so that's exactly what we're, we're calling, God's calling us to, some of these things that are, aren't really that easy, but he gives us the power to do them, amen? So today is not any different. Uh, we're in week six, and we're going to be talking about the pure in heart. And so Let's, um, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, if you'll put that up there for me. And here's what the Bible says, Matthew 5, 8, it says, blessed are the pure in heart. Why? They will see God. So I want to talk to you about being pure in heart. So the first question that you might have when you see the word heart, maybe you're asking the question, what does the Bible mean? when it refers to heart, because it's not talking about this muscle that's in your, in your chest, right? It's not talking about the literal muscle. It's talking about this. It's talking about your affections, your desires, your thoughts. It's, as as the, the commentator said, it's the seat of your thoughts, your desires, your affections. In other words, what are you chasing after? What are you desiring? 
And so when the Bible's talking about heart, it's basically our thoughts, motives, desires. Does that make sense to everybody? So knowing that, then we ask ourselves the question, if, we're, if, if it's, uh, we want to be pure in heart, what does that mean? Well, I'll make this statement to you, and this is, I want to start out giving you bad news. Anybody want some bad news? How many of you like bad news? How many of you like bad news? Nobody. So I got to give you the bad news so I can give you the good news. How many of you like good news? So how many of you are looking forward to that part of it? But I got to give you the bad news first, okay? So here's the bad news. Without Christ, you have a heart problem. Amen. Without Christ, you have a heart problem. Anybody ever heard anybody tell you that? Here's, I love this advice. Hey, I got a decision to make, and they say, well, follow your heart. <clears throat> why not? Why is that bad advice? I'll tell you why, because God's word says this in Jeremiah 17. Here's what it says. The heart is what? Everybody say deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Now, I, okay, who can understand it? So is the heart something you want to follow naturally? A big no. So that's a problem, right? So without Christ, we have a heart problem. I got more bad news for you. Jesus said it this way. He was teaching his disciples in Matthew chapter 7. This is actually a part of the Sermon on the Mount, right? And it says... Here's what he says about the heart. Now watch this. For from within, out of where? Everybody say it. Where? A person's heart, that evil thoughts come. So sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. So how many of you still want to trust your heart? The reality is that without Christ, you have a heart problem. How many of you recognize without Christ, you have a heart problem? And it, okay, raise your hand. Come on. Now listen, everybody is in that boat. Oh, no, 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 no. I love, I have a pure heart. Well, you might now, but maybe you, you, you didn't always, right? Why? Because before Christ, you had a heart problem. Amen. So, okay, pastor, if that's the bad news, what's the reality here? And maybe here's the question. If it's that bad, how is it possible to have a pure heart? Before I go on, I just want to mention this to you. So think about some of the problems in our culture today. Let's think about the fact that... Um, there's a lot of divorce and adultery in our culture today. What's that a sign of? A heart problem. Amen? What about, anybody done any, uh, any kind of business dealings lately where you had to sign a contract? How thick was the contract? I'm like, I'm, am I signing my life away here? Am I giving away a kid? Why is it that that contract has to be so thick. Because somewhere down the road, somebody was dishonest, right? And you've got to cover everything. You've got to dot every I and cross every T. Because why? Because it's a, it's a heart problem. Y'all with me? Why, why do you, when you go to, has anybody been to a government building lately? What do you have to do before you get in the building? about the airport. You got to take your shoes off now for crying out loud. We get to smell stinky feet all over the airport. Why is it that you've got to run your shoes and you got to go through a metal detector before you enter a government building in a school or an airport? Why? It's a heart problem. Y'all with me? We have a problem without Christ we have a heart problem. And so here's the question. How is it possible for us to have pure hearts if our hearts are prone to the things we just read? How do we solve the problem? Are you ready for the good news? Who's ready for the good news? Say amen. Here's the good news. Christ transforms your heart. Amen. You might be glad for that this morning. 
And so here's how, here's how I know it, because the gospel tells me. So here, if, you're, if you're taking notes, here's how Christ transforms your heart. Number one, through the gospel. There's a passage in Ezekiel chapter 36. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, much of the Old Testament points to the death and resurrection of Jesus. It foreshadows to what Christ did at the cross. And I want you to look at this. This is Ezekiel chapter 36. And here's what the, the prophet says. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all your idols. Now watch this. I love this part. I will give you, a, everybody say new heart. I will give you a new heart, not a refurbished heart. What does he say? How many of you want a new heart? He says, I will remove from you your heart of stone, the one that's calloused and, and, and just hurt by things and you, you, you've, you've had all this baggage that you're carrying. God is saying, I want to transform your heart. I'm not just going to do a makeover. I'm going to give you a new heart. Praise God. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. Watch this. And I will put my spirit in you. That's a foreshadowing to the day of Pentecost. Amen. And and move you to follow, everybody say follow, my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So how is it that a heart that's full of nastiness, that's deceitful as the Bible says, how can it be transformed through the gospel of Christ? I love it because this is exactly what the prophet Ezekiel is pointing to. He's pointing to the fact, the moment that Jesus Christ hangs on a cross, sheds his blood so that you and I could have eternal life, so that our heart can be transformed. And he's referring to the blood of Jesus. How many of you know that the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all your sins, can purify your heart? We sang it last week. Nothing but the blood. Right? That's the only thing that can transform and cleanse your heart is the blood of Jesus. Amen. And so the gospel has the transforming power to change your heart. Here's what the Bible says. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power, everybody say power, power of God unto what? Salvation. So the gospel has what? Say it loud, power. Now here's another passage, because here's what happens. Remember he said, I'll give you a new heart? What did he say? I'll give you a, everybody say new heart. Y'all going to help me this morning? What happened? Did y'all go to sleep on me? Am I that born this quick? So let's read this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what is it? You're a new creation. In other words, what's God done? He's given you a new heart. He's fulfilling that. That foreshadowing passage. He's given you a new heart. A new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. That's why I love baptism. Because it represents what just happened right here. Amen. The old has been buried. And you have been raised to new life. Anybody glad you've been raised to new life this morning? So the gospel can transform your heart. Give you a new heart. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got a new heart. Here's another way that Christ transforms your heart. He transforms your heart through your pursuit of him. So he does the initial work of salvation, right? Amen? But you didn't do anything about it. All, he, all you did was place your faith. It's what he has done. But here's the reality. From there, you have a responsibility to pursue God. And so if you want your heart transformed, you want a new heart, remember you pursue him as a follower of Jesus. Hebrews 10, says this. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Watch this. Having our hearts, what? Sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You know what the, the, the author of Hebrews is doing? He's acknowledging Ezekiel 36. He's acknowledging that Christ's blood cleanses you, puts you in right standing with God. Aren't you glad this morning that you don't have to have a guilty conscience anymore? Anybody glad your guilt's gone this morning? I'm so, I'm so thankful for that. 
that the moment that I confess Christ, that my sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west. And now I don't have to walk around in guilt and shame any longer. I'm a child of God. Are you glad you're a child of God this morning? So what's the idea? He says, draw near. Whose, part, whose responsibility is it to draw near? It's yours. So I draw near to God because my conscience is clear. I don't, I don't go in shame. I don't go in guilt. No, I go boldly, as the back book of Hebrews says. I go boldly to the throne of grace and find help and strength in my time of need. Are you glad for that today? And I love what 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells us in verse 22. He says, flee. Everybody say flee. flee. Now, when, I talk, when we talk about flee, we're not talking about, hey, let me just casually walk away. What are you doing? You're high-telling it. What does he say? High-tell it from the evil desires of your youth. And then what's, what's the remedy? What do you do as a result of fleeing? What do you do? You pursue. Everybody say pursue. So you flee. All of the youthful lusts, the evil desires, and you pursue. What are you pursuing? You're pursuing righteousness, which means the right standing that you have before God, the right behavior because you're in Christ. And notice this. Not only are you pursuing righteousness, but you're pursuing faith, you're pursuing love, you're pursuing peace, all along with those who call on the Lord out of a, say it loud, pure heart. You see the connection? As the Holy Spirit, as Jesus Christ is transforming your heart, your desires change. You pursue different things than you did before. You're, not, you're no longer pursuing sexual immorality and adultery. Now you're pursuing righteousness and faith and love. Are y'all with me so far? And it's your responsibility to do that. You know, it's, it's challenging in our culture, isn't it? There's a lot of temptation. Would you agree? Because here's the truth. Used to, years ago, before computers, there was a TV, right? But where was the TV? It was in the living room, right? And the kids were the remote control. I remember being the remote control when I was growing up. Anybody else the remote control growing up? But where was it? It was in the center of the room, and there was no room... For somebody to go off and, and look at stuff they, want, they shouldn't look at, right? What's happened? Now we all have our own personal devices. Now, obviously we can't put that genie back in the bottle, right? Amen? Some of you couldn't do it. You'd die without your phone or your iPad, right? So we can't put that. So if, if we have temptation to, to go into our room, right? Lock the door and look at stuff we're not supposed to. Something's got to be done because what are we doing? We're fleeing what? Help me, po folks. We're fleeing youthful lust and we're pursuing righteousness. And so if this is a temptation, something's got to be done. Television, social media, the internet, part of our fleeing might be to delete some of the apps on our phone. Maybe TikTok's not a good idea for you. Or Instagram may not be a good idea for you. Or... There's somebody that you know that will hold you accountable and say, hey, would you, would you put some settings on my phone where I can't look at certain things? I'm trying to help you this morning, amen? What's the, what's the goal? What did, what did Jesus say? Blessed are what? The pure in heart. And so whatever I got to do, folks, however, however I have to do to make sure that I'm not putting stuff in that keeps me from having a pure heart. I know this isn't popular preaching, but it's necessary. Why? Because blessed are those who have a pure heart. Amen. So if we limit our time on the phone, on the iPad, at the TV, on the computer, and we, we replace that, what are we going to replace it with? Well, we're going to replace it with a pursuit of righteousness, a pursuit of faith, a pursuit of love. Amen. And that's where the change begins to happen is when we allow the Holy Spirit, when we allow the blood of Christ, Jesus Christ, to cleanse us. And so here's how you pursue. You pursue through prayer. Amen? Our pursuing is done through prayer. And here's the statement I'll make. The more time you spend with God in prayer, the greater the opportunity for your heart to be purified. 
Can I say that one more time? Our, the more time you spend with God in prayer, the greater opportunity for your heart to be purified. Remember, he's holy. Remember, our object, our objective is to be like him, to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Amen? Do you guys remember the story in the Old Testament of David. Anybody know who David is? I, don't wanna, I never want to assume everybody knows. David was an Old Testament king. Probably the greatest king to ever rule Israel. As a matter of fact, his rule was called the Golden Age of Israel because they were so successful. And the Bible says that David, this is, so, this is really um, strange to me, but the Bible says David has a, is a man after God's own heart. And yet we, everybody know what happened to him? Here's what he didn't do. He didn't flee youthful lust. So there's a, there's a passage in the Bible that says uh, in, a, in a season where kings go to war, remember David was a king, David stayed back. So here's, here's, the, here's the challenge. Things are going well for David. He's a successful king, and you know what he does? He gets complacent. Instead of going out and fulfilling his responsibility as a king, going to war, he stays back and lets his, his generals take care of it. And what happens is he's, he's tempted. He goes out on his, I could see him out on his balcony, and he looks across the way, and he sees a woman bathing, which was stupid on her part, right? Amen? Come on, somebody. If you know you're in view of somebody, what are you going to do? Take it inside. But she doesn't do that. And so David sees her, and he's a male. Come on. I'm just being real with you guys. He's a male. His heart is like the one we just described. And so he sees her. He begins to lust after her, and, and the temptation becomes too great. It becomes to the point where he says, go get her. And he slept with her, another man's wife. This is the man after God's own heart. And as a result, he has a baby by her and he has her husband killed. Heart problem. Would you agree it's a heart problem? He didn't flee youthful lust. Of course, he didn't have 2 Timothy 2.22. Amen? But he didn't know the law of God. He didn't know it was wrong to commit adultery, did he not? And so, the beauty of this is, he tries to hide it all, but how many of you know God, God knows everything? You can't hide stuff. Now, I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm just saying it's a reality. God knows. And so, he lovingly has the prophet Nathan confront David, and he says, David, you've messed up. And David had a choice to make, didn't he? He could have said, who are you? I'm the king. I'll do what I want to. But that's not what he did. And here's how we know he had a heart after God. Because he repented of his sin. And the prayer that he prayed as repentance is found in Psalm chapter 51 in the Old Testament. And I want to read to you his prayer. Now this isn't all of this. This is one passage, one piece of the prayer. I want you to read this with me. Create in me a what? Say it loud. O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What was he doing? He understood who could cleanse his heart. He understood who would purify his heart. Who is it? It's God. And so here's my challenge to you. As you're fleeing youthful lust and you're pursuing God, why not make this prayer every morning? Could this prayer keep you from falling into temptation? I believe, it, I believe it's absolutely possible. And so when we pray every morning, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit. I promise you that over time, God's going to change your heart. Amen? How many of you long for a pure heart? Prayer is your pursuit. Amen? Here's another one. Through his word. How does he transform your heart? Through the gospel, through your pursuit of him, and through his word. Now, I'll, I'll declare this plainly. If you're not reading God's word, I'll say this with all confidence. It'll be impossible.
for you to have a pure heart. Amen? Because his word, watch this, John 17, 17. This is Jesus talking. He says, sanctify. This is a prayer he prayed for you as a follower of Jesus. He says, sanctify. Everybody say sanctify. Sanctify by them by your truth. What? Your word is truth. And so the word sanctify means set apart, holy, pure. What's he saying? He understood the truth that the word purifies the heart. That when you take in God's word, it cleanses and purifies your heart. Amen? Psalm 119 says it another way. I have hidden, everybody say hidden. Your word where? I mean, are you taking up pieces of, of Bible and stuffing it in your shirt? No, what are you doing? You're looking at, you're reading, you're studying, you're praying, you're, you're memorizing God's word. And as a result, you're hiding it. In, remember, the heart is the seat of the affections, the seat of your desires. And so when you take in the word of God, what does it say? I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the, the Christ purifies our heart, transforms our heart through his word. Amen. Part of your pursuit. Remember, we're talking about pursuing. Part of your pursuit involves reading, studying, hearing, memorizing, meditating. And then here's the, the kicker, applying God's word. It's in the application that God does the transformation. Amen. Amen. It's in the application that God does the transformation. One more passage, Joshua chapter 1. You guys remember the story of Joshua. Moses died outside the promised land. Joshua's the new leader to lead Israel to the, the land that God had promised them. And he has a conversation with God. And here's what God says to him. Here's how you can be successful in your pursuit. What does it say? The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall what? Everybody say meditate. meditate. How, how often? Day and night. And that you may observe. Oh, watch this. Observe to do. Everybody say observe to do. Observe to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. You want a pure heart? Meditate on God's word. And here's, here's the, the part that I want you to get. Observe. What are you doing when you observe something? You're seeing it, right? You're looking into it, and it says to do. In other words, again, I read God's word to act on it. So meditation puts you in a position where you can know God's word here and here, and then you act on it becomes where the power is. Amen? So you observe to do. So God transforms your heart as you Accept the gospel as you pursue him through prayer and as you read and study and meditate and apply the word of God. There's a passage in Romans that says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. So God's word is powerful to transform your heart. Here's the next one, through the Holy Spirit. Remember the prophet Ezekiel said, I'm going to fill you with my spirit. I love this because before, before the Holy Spirit was poured out the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was at work. He would, in the Old Testament, like there would be a moment, Joseph, where the, he, would, he would just kind of be on somebody for a temporary moment, and then it would almost like he would leave. After the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that his spirit is in us. Amen. Working in us and through us. Boy, that's good news today. That means you're never alone. That means every time you open up the Bible, that every time you pray, you have access to the Spirit of God. Man, that's good news. And so he transforms you through his Spirit. Watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed. Everybody say transformed. Into what? Who's he? Jesus Christ. 
We're transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So in other words, the Spirit of God plays a crucial role in your heart transformation. Amen. The Bible says this, and I, don't, I didn't put it in the, the, the passages, but Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, the way you think, okay? The Holy Spirit is responsible for helping change the way you think, amen? And therefore, he transforms your heart. Anybody want your heart transformed this morning? Galatians 5, you probably are familiar with this passage, these passages, and here's uh, Paul talking about the work of, of works of the flesh and then the Holy Spirit. Watch what he says. He says, so I say walk, How? By the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Watch this. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict. Remember that fleeing, pursuing thing that we're talking about? And the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. Watch this. The acts of the flesh. Is this, is this familiar to anybody else? Sexual immorality. Impurity. Debauchery. Have we seen this already today? Idolatry. Witchcraft. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions. And envy. Drunkenness. Orgies. And the like. I warn you. Everybody say, I warn you. As I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's heavy, right? Now, watch watch this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, watch this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, have what, what have they done? They've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then it says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step. With the Spirit. So here's the Spirit's role in transforming your heart. Every day that you walk with Him in step. I love that. I like, you know, I'm a rhythm guy. I'm a musician. Any other musicians in here? Some some of you, you're kind of rhythmic in how you live, right? You got a rhythm to your, your week, your day. Anybody have a rhythm to your day every day? Some of you so rigid, boy, you if something happens, you go crazy. But, but here, so here's the, here's the idea when I say rhythm. When you walk in rhythm with the Spirit, in step with Him, there's a transformation that happens, folks. Why? Because He's calling the shots. How many of you are willing to let the Holy Spirit call the shots? I didn't see many hands go up. He is responsible for the transformation. Paul reiterates Jesus' list. As a matter of fact, he he makes a larger list than Jesus did, didn't he? And he says to us, your remedy for your heart issue, for your heart problem, is letting the Holy Spirit lead your life. Is it that simple, Pastor? How many of you agree that's that simple? The problem is, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, we are control freaks. We want, to, we want to control our lives. But the more we do that, the harder it is for us to live and have a pure heart before God. So this is my challenge to you today. Give Him control. Why? Because the gospel transforms your heart. Your pursuit of God transforms the heart. Your word transforms your heart. And the Holy Spirit transforms the heart. How do you get from an evil, deceitful heart to a transformed heart? All those things I just mentioned. And then the end of that beatitude, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does that mean? Really? Well, I kind of want to break this down. Um, First of all, before Christ, the Bible describes you as an enemy of God. And something happens... When you place your faith in Christ, the Bible says that you're no longer 
an enemy of God. And your eyes have been opened because before the enemy has blinded you, he has kept you from seeing your need for God. And so the Holy Spirit helps you with the spiritual blindness and now you can see that you need Jesus. That's what spiritual poverty is all about. I realize that apart from Christ, I'm spiritually bankrupt. And my eyes now see, I need Jesus. And the beauty of this is, folks, that after Christ, after he begins the work in you, your eyes are open to see the beauty and the majesty of all that God has for you. Amen. And the truth is, folks, when you see him in this light, it'll change your life. Because some of you have had wrong visions of God. You've seen him as mean, and judgmental, and ready to crack the whip on you. When he's saying, yes, I'm holy, yes, I hate sin, but I love you so much. That I made a way not to have to sin. Amen? What did he say? He said, I offer you eternal life. I offer you a life greater than you could ever imagine. And when you begin to see it from that lens, man, it opens up a whole new world for you. Are you glad for that today? I'm telling you, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I believe that uh, this idea of of seeing God is, is in all of your life. And so, recently, um, I've just been obsessed with these, these mountain images. And I mentioned the, the, the area in Canada called Banff. You guys, somebody even sent me a picture of that afterward la- a couple of weeks ago. And, and then other places across this, this country where it's just breathtaking beauty, Tony. And when I have the right lens that I'm looking through, I begin to say, you know what, God? You are a master artist. You know, just the other day, Tammy Watkins posted on Facebook some pictures of a sunset, and it was just absolutely beautiful. And you know what the idea is? God is a master artist. When you begin to look at life and you see everything around you through a different lens, it's beautiful. And then you begin to understand that you were once an enemy of God, and now you're a friend of God. Boy, that's amazing, isn't it? And this is the beauty of being able to see God. Here's how how we'll say it. When you have this clear picture of God, number one, you see his character. You see that he is merciful. You see that he is gracious. You see that he is faithful. Can anybody attest to those things today? That he's merciful, gracious, faithful. That he is good. Amen? All my life you have been faithful. Anybody glad for he's good this morning? You begin to see his righteousness. The fact that he is, is right, his right behavior in everything that he does. You begin to see that he is holy and just. This is the different lens that you're looking through. You see him that way. Number two. You recognize his provision and his protection. Are you glad that he says that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory? That he's not shorthanded in being able to take care of you. Amen? How many of you have been a, can attest to that? That he's your provider. That you have that, you have that testimony that he's provided for you time and time again. That he has protected you time and time again. That, that wreck should have killed you. Amen? But what did he do? He gave his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. So when you begin to see God in a different picture, you see him as this wonderful God who is a great loving father who protects and provides. Amen? You begin to see him and begin to value the importance of living righteously. Not out of, not out of obligation, folks. Not because somebody's beating you over the head telling you you got to. No, it's because you love God. Because you have this personal friendship with God. And you don't want to hurt his heart. My dad, I never, I hated, anybody hated disappointing your dad? 
or your parents. I always hated disappointing my dad. And you know why? Because I loved my dad. I respected my dad. And so it kept me in check. It kept my behavior in check. No, not always, but most of the time, my adoration and my respect and my love for my dad kept me in check. The same is true for our relationship with God. I understand the value of living right, of following Jesus' commands. And here's what Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And it's not that we're doing it. He's not giving us this warning, right? Well, you better, you better prove you love me by obeying. No, it's, it's because you love me outsprings the obedience, amen? It's always, folks, your obedience always should stem from a relationship with God, not a fear of his judgment, amen? Amen. Here's the last one, and I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. This is the part that we look forward to, that one day, should the Lord tarry, you're going to die, right? Or if he comes back when you're still alive, either way, guess what you get? You get to see him. You get to behold your Savior, the one who hung on the cross for you, the one who rose from the dead for you. You get, to lay, you get to lay your eyes on him face to face. And here's what John said in 1 John chapter 3. Dear friends, now we are what? Say it loud. You're what? Are you glad for that this morning? And what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Amen? Why? We shall see him as he is. Folks, the pure in heart will see God. Not only here in the beauty of, of what he's created and the beauty of a relationship, but one day, literally, you're going to behold the beauty and majesty of your Savior. Are you thankful for that this morning? I'm so looking forward to that. Aren't you looking? How many of you are looking forward to it? Say amen if you're looking forward to it. Amen. So what's your response today? Number one, recognize this reality, folks. This is the bad news. Your heart is impure apart from Jesus. In other words, you're in some serious trouble. Amen? Number two, realize, oh, excuse me, respond by faith to the gospel, and be transformed. If that's you today, if you're sitting under the sound of my voice, either here in the room or on, watching online, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, today's a good day for you. Why? Because we're going to offer this opportunity for, in just a few minutes for you to accept Christ, to receive his salvation, and be on a journey to a pure heart. Here's number three. Flee the old habits. Everybody say flee. In other words, run from them and do what? Pursue God. Here's what you do. You pray. You read God's word. That's your pursuit. Amen? Number four. Let the Holy Spirit lead your life. You'll have the pure heart if you'll let him lead. You see, we can't legislate this stuff, right? Are you real with me, folks? We can't make it, you know, there was a shooting this week. Two, two cops. Breaks my heart. Two people upholding the law. Their lives ended because somebody's heart was impure. But you know what? Creating another law isn't going to change those two guys that shot them. What's it going to take? It's going to take the gospel of Christ doing a transformation in here. It's an inside-out work, folks. It's only accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. The last one. Realize that when you see things rightly, you appreciate. You appreciate who God is and what He's done, and you look forward to seeing Him face to face. Thank you for joining us for this week's service. We pray that God has used this moment to greatly impact your life. We invite you to live fully alive in Christ with us here at Full Life Church. We'll see you next week.